Moscow, the 6th of May, 2013. Thousands of protesters gather to demand the release of political prisoners. These are their photos, long-time activists and common people. They're all in prison for having demonstrated against Vladimir Putin a year earlier. The next on the list might be this man, Alexei Navalny. In just two years, he's become the number one opponent of the regime. They're scared. On the other side of the river, they've got people observing us. In less than a year, he's been subjected to four separate investigations, all of them bogus, according to the opposition. I don't care. Let them charge me 124 times. I don't give a damn. I'll still say what I want and what I think. You know me. I'll always tell the truth. Last July, Alexei Navalny was sentenced to five years in prison. Since Putin's return to the Kremlin, prison has once again become a political weapon like in the days of the Gulag. Our film takes us to Mordovia, where Nadia of the Pussy Riot is being held. Considered a rebel in need of re-education, as they used to say in Soviet times. And beyond the political prisoners, 700,000 others are being detained in Russia's prisons for non-political offences. What we uncovered was methodical brutality. Men and women and entire families all broken by the system. A tragedy happening with complete impunity behind locked doors. 20 years after the collapse of the USSR, the Gulag might no longer exist in name, but its methods live on. We begin our investigation in Mordovia, 500 kilometers east of Moscow. Here, there are numerous camps along a 40 kilometer stretch of road. In all, 16 prisons with 14,000 detainees. In Russia, these penitentiaries are known as reform colonies. Here, almost all the locals make a living from the camps. Nothing much seems to have changed from communist time. Piotr has come from Moscow to visit his wife, who's being held in Colony 14. Before each visit, he does a little shopping in one of the village stores. I've bought Nadia some bananas, oranges, dried fruits, uh, fruit-flavored teas. Why are you buying all this? Well, there's not much food in prison. That's why we bring things from the outside. Piotr's wife is well known. She's Nadia Tolonikova of Pussy Riot, here seen wearing green. Last year, along with four other militants, Nadia occupied the largest cathedral in Moscow for an anti-Putin punk prayer session. Nadia was charged with hooliganism and incitement of religious hatred. Her 50-second performance cost her two years in prison. To Piotr, the sentence was purely political. And Mordovia is symbolic, as Stalin built the first gulags here in the 1920s. Mordovia is known for its brutality. This is where the political prisoners were held. They wrote a lot about it, uh, the life in these camps. So Mordovia has always been associated in Russia with political prisoners. Stop, stop filming, it's not allowed. Stop filming. The next stop is at the court in Zubovo Poliana. Nadia asks to be released on parole. Pussy Riot wears prison uniform. There's no raised fist, and the strident anti-Putin activists behave like a model prisoner. 
I read several political news magazines, uh, the New Times, for example. I realize now, after reading them, what's happening in the outside world, and to stay away from troublemakers in prison. All day, her life in prison is examined, her psychological profile, her workshop performance, her letters. Her father, however, believes it's all just a sham. It's just a formality. It's 100% certain that it'll be refused. There's not the slightest political signal or will in, in this sense. To the penitentiary's management, Nadja doesn't deserve freedom as she's refused to ask for forgiveness. And it's the argument that the tribunal uses. The request for release on parole is denied. The judgment is no surprise, and Nadja has to put up with it. Someone in the room cries shame, as Nadja is led away in handcuffs. Piotr, her husband, claims it's a warning to all political opponents. Vladimir Putin has decided to send people to prison to repress the discontent in Russia. It's also to show everyone where the line is that shouldn't be crossed, and if it is, the retribution will be brutal. The young woman is taken back to the camps in a van, knowing she has to serve her full sentence up to March 2014. Pussy Riot's fate was decided here in this cathedral close to the Kremlin. Katya is the group's guitarist. She was also arrested and was remanded in custody for seven months before finally being released. So this is the scene of the crime, as they say. <laughs> this is where we did the show, yes. There was no crime. That's what's so absurd about it. Throughout the whole affair, it was obvious to everyone we were innocent. But unfortunately, there was all this crazy propaganda about our alleged blasphemy. Everything was done to make us appear in a bad light. Katya is free, but under probation. She has to register with the police once a month. It wasn't the first time Pussy Riot had made waves. Throughout the winter of 2011-2012, the feminist group carried out a series of protests in front of a police station, inside luxury goods shops, and in particular, Red Square, right under the Kremlin. Vladimir Putin was prime minister at the time and doesn't stop the unprecedented protest. But then the authorities got scared. It, it seemed to be a sign they'd lost control. And that's what they fear the most. Putin, in the meanwhile, had once again become president. We know we're under surveillance. Let's say the, the secret services are interested in us, and clearly their mission is to prevent us doing anything. Today we're under threat. I'm on probation and could be sent back to prison. And the other two girls who were with us in the Christ the Saviour Cathedral that day risk being arrested. A dozen or so Pussy Riot members are still at liberty, but now they don't dare risk showing up anywhere in their trademark hoodies. In 2013, NGOs estimated there were some 200 political prisoners in Russia. Sometimes they're simple protesters. On the 6th of May 2012, on the eve of Putin's return to the Kremlin, one demonstration ended badly. It marked the start of political repression. Dozens of people were arrested. Lyotcha, shown here, was one of them. Along with 14 other protesters, he's still being held in preventative custody pending judgment. Lyotcha used to live in this Moscow apartment block. 
His parents still haven't come to terms with the situation. Their son wasn't a militant. A sociology student, he'd spent his military service in the Russian Navy. Here he is taking his oath, which he took facing all the others. It's part of the ritual. Lyotcha is a patriot, even though he doesn't like to show it. He's very modest. We were the ones who were proud of his serving in the Navy. He never made a big deal of it. He just did his military service and, and that was it. Lyotcha risks a 13-year sentence for riotous behavior and violence against the police. His parents and fiancé are campaigning to prove his innocence. Yorcha saw a, a young man being beaten by the police at the demonstration. He tried to help him, but he wasn't able to. And then he was also set upon and beaten with truncheons. All he had done was to try and defend someone, and now he's accused of the violence. The accusations are ridiculous, it's completely absurd. Nevertheless, Lyotcha's family know he'll be sentenced. The next day in a Moscow street, Tanya is dressed up for a special occasion. I'm going to marry Lyotcha. In prison. Or a prison marriage. Yes. Did you ever expect this? Of course not. I don't think anyone dreams of getting married in prison. In fact, I never thought of getting married at all, let alone in prison. In one year, Tanya and Miocha had only seen each other once. One of the reasons they got married was the greater number of visits they could now expect. At the end of the courtyard is Moscow's most famous prison, the Butyrka. It's where political prisoners were locked up at the time of Stalin. The camera isn't allowed far and Tanya hurries along, looking forward to holding Lyotcha in her arms. The young couple were allowed 10 minutes alone after the ceremony. On leaving, Tanya catches up with her friends and the committee of support for the prisoners of the 6th of May. Thank you, thank you. Oh, stop with the flowers, there's so many. Yorcha says hello to everybody. It warms his heart to know you're all here, his friends and even those he, he doesn't know. His message to you all is no pasaran, keep fighting, keep going. Tanya returns home on her own. The next time she'll see her husband will be at his trial. We catch up with Piotr, the husband of the Pussy Riot in prison in Mordovia. He's back home now in Moscow. Ever since he was arrested, he's been very active on the social media and looks after Nadja's Facebook pages. That night, the couple have permission to speak on the phone. Hello. A few days after her hearing, Nadja is very worried. They'll end up putting me in solitary because I've received two warnings. T tell me, tell me, let's start with that. No, forget it, I'll get by. I don't need your help. No, tell, tell me why they gave you those warnings and, and stay calm. Nadia will now have to face a disciplinary hearing and she whispers knowing she's being observed. When Piotr says she should lodge a complaint, Nadia cracks. No. I don't care. You don't understand. Yes, I do understand. They'll never let me out of here. Come on, come on, wait a minute. Wait, you talk to the media, you write, and now it seems you don't care about prison reforms. Why are you contradicting yourself? Well done. Oh, Piotr, it's easy to reform prisons when you're sitting on your couch at home. 
Пиздец. The conversation is cut. Действительно, вот, видимо, этим давлением... Put a lot of pressure on her. It's, it's making her life very miserable. She's very upset. And that's why she's finding it so so hard in the prison camp at the moment. Usually a determined fighter, Nadja appears on the verge of giving up. What really goes on inside Russian prisons? To try and answer that, we're heading out to Mordovia again. We're traveling with a former detainee, Nadezhda. She was a non-political prisoner who spent seven years in the camps for drug smuggling. Released just a few months earlier, it's the first time she's returning to the area. Mordovia. That's Mordovia. Again. It's still Mordovia. Again. It's a land of horror, it's forsaken by God. Nadezhda made the same trip a few years earlier in a special prison van called a Wagonzak. It's an area about this size in, in the van, but less comfortable, much more basic. It didn't have any windows, just bars. And instead of a door, there was also a, a, a grill. In such a small space, they'd cram 15 or 20 people. It was packed to bursting. Here in Russia, we say prison doesn't change you. You're the same person. But you know what? It's not true. We get off at Potma, the first village along the prison route. Behind the fence are huts that hold about a hundred prisoners. Nadezhda went through hell here, no privacy, little or no hygiene, and above all, near military discipline. Mordovia is the army. You have to respect the rules, always wear the uniform, always salute the wardens. You have to. For example, if you're at one end of the courtyard and the wardens are at the other, you must still salute. Or when everyone in the hut goes to the canteen, then everyone has to shout out loudly and in unison, good morning. It's hell. And even though I've been released nowadays, if I see someone in uniform, I have the reflex to, to salute them. The good morning one wants to come out. The guards immediately punish anyone who doesn't comply. We got hold of these two videos filmed by one of the security cameras. You can see prisoners being beaten by a guard in a penal colony in the extreme east of Russia. Natasha says the video is hardly surprising. I'm not surprised to see this sort of thing. It happens all the time. In the penal colonies, I had the same experience. I saw it for myself. So I can't say, what a nightmare, how dare they, because they do dare, and they do do it. Nadezhda was beaten regularly. It could have been worse, she says. In the camps in Mordovia, the guards give you a choice, the truncheon or sanctions. I thought it was better to be beaten and get it over with rather than be sanctioned because it'll appear in your files and that makes it much harder to get parole. So you preferred being beaten? Of course, no question. I have children, my mother. I had to be with them again. I thought I had to get out of the camp. It was the only thing I ever thought of about getting out, about leaving. As for the prison guards, they only rarely seem troubled. But videos smuggled out from the inside can be awkward. Prison violence is endemic throughout the country. In Moscow, an NGO monitors mistreatment in prison. Valentin is a former prisoner and joined the organization after his release. Good morning. 
This is a special file on beatings. Altai, Bashkiria, Vladimir, Yekaterinburg, Baikal, just about everywhere in Russia. Valentin sifts through hundreds of complaints, photographs and videos such as this one, which he has just received. The video comes from a security camera in a prison camp in Siberia. You can see how the camp staff here treats and, and punishes the prisoners. To them it seems like an honor to grab a detainee and then take it in turns in, in beating him. They, they actually seem to believe it's their duty to behave like this. The violence becomes systematic. In certain penal camps it begins as soon as you step foot inside. In this video, a warden films a new inmate. The idea is to make it clear from the start what the rules are inside. It's what they call prevention. The guards make it clear how they'll deal with the slightest opposition. Any wrong move or, or word will cost them dearly for the duration of their sentence. We tried to trace the source of the video. The prisoner's name is Shamil, and the scene took place in May 2012 in the south of the country. In the video, the guards try and smother him with his own hat. It was a lesson in prevention that proved effective. Shamil never filed a complaint. But his father, however, did. In every region, there's a torture colony. This is where prisoners from other camps can be sent to at any time. And it's to break, to destroy their spirit, their will. And you know, when they leave, they're like vegetables. In fact, they can consider themselves lucky if they haven't been permanently handicapped. But they'll all be morally and physically destroyed. The NGO has produced a blacklist of the torture colonies in all some 50 throughout the country. The director of the NGO says that more than 20 years after the fall of the USSR, Russia has still not rid itself of the cancer of gulags. It's as if the gulags' cancerous spread has begun to develop again under Putin. Even if they haven't reached the proportions they had under Stalin, the cancers of torture, murder, rapes, and no one is punished for it. That's the 21st century gulag. The new gulag, the return of political repression. Torture behind locked doors. There are those who openly compare Putin to Stalin. On a primetime TV show in April 2013, an opposition journalist put the question to him directly. Let me ask you, three years ago on this program, you spoke how you could relate to Stalin. To who? Stalin. Now, some of my colleagues and myself have noticed certain things that resemble Stalinism. Do you really believe that by using these Stalinist methods, Russia can be a great power in the 21st century? I don't think there's any Stalinism here. Stalinism is the culture of the personality, the massive violation of law, repression, and prison camps. There's nothing like that in Russia. And I hope it'll never return. But that doesn't mean there shouldn't be order and discipline. Next destination is Chelyabinsk in the Urals, 2,000 kilometers from Moscow, where there were rumors of a mutiny against torture. At the airport, Oksana, a human rights activist, and Daniil, a former prisoner, join us. The tone is soon set as we are followed, with one car in front and another behind. They're going very slowly. 
We'll go around the roundabout a few times to see what the car following us does. We get to the roundabout. And of course, it's still following. It's going round once again. <laughs> they seem very used to the game of cat and mouse. Ah, he's taken the exit, he's understood. He's stopping. They're good, he stopped. He realized we were taking him for a ride. The car waits for us and we take down its number plate. A few minutes later, it's back on our heels. If you'd come on your own, they would have stopped you at the airport. Uh, they'd have asked you why you were visiting, about your hotel, and that's it. But now they've seen that you're with us, that's why they're tailing us. Oksana and Daniel believe it's intimidation by the secret police. This is Colony 6 in the suburbs of Chelyabinsk. It's here last November where an uprising against torture took place. For 48 hours, in temperatures of minus 15 degrees centigrade, the prisoners took turns occupying the rooftops. Oksana came here as quickly as she could. They called it a mutiny, but it wasn't. It was an act of desperation. The detainees climbed on to the roofs and the two towers over there. There are a lot of them on that one. They unfurled a banner that said, help us. And later on this building, they hung up another banner. And that one read, they're blackmailing us. They're torturing us. The riot police was deployed around the camp. The prisoners negotiated and they ended their protest without violence. Well, actually, we'd been expecting it since May, because this is the worst colony there is. Suddenly, Daniel stops talking as a warden has spotted us. Daniel knows him. He's only recently been released from here after three years inside. Yeah, your name's Fokin, but, but what's your first name? This is the guard that beat me and tortured me. What did you say? You tortured me. Impossible. In the warden's office, you hit my testicles. And in solitary, you chained me to the railings and gassed me. Who did that to you? You did. Is it true? No, it's not true. What do you mean it's not true? It's a lie. Torture is a lie. We don't torture people. Turn the camera off. The guard heads off to raise the alarm. We decide to continue filming on the other side of the penal colony. It's systematic. Every day, from morning till night, one prisoner after another. They're in solitary. Now, that's where they tortured us. They tied us up and took our clothes off. Then they forced us into this position with our hands and, and, and legs tied to the bars. They spread our legs as, as far apart as they could and, and put pencils under our feet so we couldn't stand properly. And afterwards they put a metal bar bucket on our heads, along with a siren like a car alarm. And later the prison warden would, would use tear gas and lock us in. It happened in the solitary wing sick bay. During our visit, an NGO provided us with video filmed inside Colony 6. There are dormitories packed with prisoners. canteen and the workshops with inmates sewing uniforms and the sick bay Daniel had mentioned the cage to which prisoners were attached with sticky tape to be tortured T touch it is it still sticky touch it yes yes it's still sticky such evidence is increasing it's estimated 10% of all prisoners in Russia undergo this kind of treatment. That's 70,000 people, more than the entire prison population of some West European nations. 
Since his release from the camps, Daniil has lived with his younger sister in Chelyabinsk. Convicted of manslaughter, he spent 11 years in a reform colony. One month after being freed, he's readjusting to life on the outside. This is the first ice cream I've had in 11 years. We didn't get this. Mm, it's, it's really good. When we were small, they weren't as good as this. Didn't exist. They were only Soviet ice creams. In 11 years, Daniil and Masha only saw each other once. They're now trying to make up for lost time. Masha remembers the day her brother was released. We arrived very early that day, and, and we had to wait a long time. And I was so nervous, and we were so, so cold. Mum tried to get me to wait in the car, but I wanted to stay outside, even if it meant getting sick. I wanted to wait for him to make sure I didn't miss him. Daniil is looking for work, but without a diploma and only experience of prison, it's difficult. To call them reform colonies is nonsense. I spent 11 years in one, and there were no attempts at reforming us. All I saw, uh, all I learned was humiliation, was violence, torture, extortion, slavery, and even murder. My family has helped me a lot. And I take tranquilizers because I can't deal with it by myself. The memories come flooding back and I start shaking inside. It affects the mind, of course. It leaves scars. Daniil is by no means the only victim of torture in Colony 6. The silence was broken when the prisoners mutinied. Oksana visits a local NGO. With Dina, who is responsible for visiting the prison camps, she's collected over 1,000 complaints by detainees in Colony 6. Take Colony 6. Look, it's just one long list of never-ending complaints. The guards say the inmates are monsters who've committed awful crimes. But the guards themselves have become the criminals. If you kill, if you rape, if you torture, you are also a criminal. But for some reason the guards think that they're within their rights. Well, they say they're doing their jobs. We're following orders. It's our job, they say. Many of the complaints, as Dina and Oksana point out, are about endemic extortion. It's the torture business. They say to the prisoners, you don't want to be beaten? Well, naturally, no prisoner wants to be beaten. So they're told to, to ask their parents to bring something, like cleaning materials. They say, here's the phone, call them. Cleaning or building materials to maintain the colony, the guards blatantly make use of the family's resources. It's what's called humanitarian aid. And it adds up, it multiplies, they always demand more. The families are sometimes forced into taking out loans. Uh, sometimes they have to sell their cars or spend all their money, and they get into debt. To all intents and purposes, some families end up working for the prison camp so that their son or husband won't be beaten up. The activists have also gathered evidence of bank transfers to secret accounts. It's estimated extortion brings in the equivalent of $65,000 to Colony 6 alone. Few families agreed to talk about the racketeering, fearing reprisals against their sons or husbands behind bars. We head to Zlatust, 150 kilometers from Chelyabinsk. In some neighborhoods, there's no water or paved roads. It's in one of these where we meet Vera.
Her son Victor is in Colony 6. He was arrested five years ago for drug trafficking. Since being sent to the prison camp, Victor has been caught in a web of extortion. It began with gifts in kind. Vera has kept a record of it all. I began the list when my son arrived at the colony. He rang me and, and to tell me what, what he needed. He said, write this down quickly, I don't have much time. So I wrote down uh, pliers, batteries, wire strippers, uh, cables, and I said, that's a lot of cables, why do you need 300 meters? He said it was for the camp, and if you bring it, things will be easier for me. Then the bank transfer started. Vera has the receipts. 2,000 rubles, 4,000 rubles, about $130. And the demands from the prison wardens didn't stop there. After a while, he rang and said he needed 40,000 rubles. But I didn't have that kind of money. 40,000 rubles, the equivalent of $1,300, was six months' salary for Vera. These days, Vera lives with her son's fiance, Irina. In a few minutes, they're scheduled to speak with Victor by phone. He came out of solitary yesterday. He'd been inside for 10 days. Why? It's because he wasn't wearing his badge as he was meant to. Victor calls from the camp. He knows that we're there. Hang on. Wait, we're recording. Hello, sweetheart. How are you? I'm fine, how about you? It's been a long time since you rang. I couldn't, I've just finished solitary. We asked about what happened to prisoners who couldn't pay. Well, if you'd promised to, to give them something and you don't, then they'll put you in solitary. Has that happened to you? Yes, yes. And in solitary they beat me up. They spread my legs as, as far as they could. And they hit me on my head. It's very difficult. I knew this happened in this reform colony, but I didn't know it had happened to my son until now. It's very difficult. But I still believe that justice will be done, one day. An inquiry into what goes on in Colony 6 did take place and Vera testified, all in vain. The prison authorities deny all accusations of extortion and torture. They also refuse to be interviewed, citing the topic is, quote, too sensitive. But one man does agree to talk. He lives in the same region, but a little further north. Sergei Vitoshkin is a former prison director. He retired seven years ago and is very frank about Russia's prison system. His comments are uncompromising. They say it's a legacy of the gulags, the concentration camps, and yes, it's true, it is. The system is that of the gulags. The manner in which prisoners are kept is like that in the concentration camps. But they should be treated like human beings. There has to be rules, of course, but they should be held in humane conditions and not packed in like sardines in a tin. It's what the NGOs also say, but he then changes his tune. You spoke about this system, but we found this video. Can you tell us about it? Guards inside his prison shot the video when he was the camp director. 
It shows a newly arrived prisoner who's refused to clean the toilets. In the next scene, the same prisoner is covered with severe bruises. Sergei Vetoshkin confirms the video was filmed in his camp and admits it's genuine. Is this an example of the quote, special methods? Yes, it's an RP-73 truncheon. Is that legal? Yes. The man who uses the truncheon knows how far he can go. It's up to him to decide how far he has to go so that the prisoner understands it's better to follow orders. The prisoner can hardly walk and needs to be supported by other inmates. That's the last time you pretend not to understand? Yes. You agree to behave from now on? Yes. Exhausted, the prisoner ends up cleaning the toilets with his bare hands. We use this video to show, to show it to the new inmates, so afterwards they'd understand that they'd better follow orders. It's best to video something like this to, to show to the others. Better this than having to do the same to ten prisoners. Do you think it's worse? What do you think? I don't know. I do. I know. Sometimes you have to choose the lesser of two evils. The former director justifies his methods, yet his former detainees named him the Professor of Torture. In Chelyabinsk, we catch up again with Daniel, the former inmate who described the torture in Colony 6. He's visiting the grave of a fellow prisoner who died the previous year inside the penal colony. I don't recognize him from the photograph. It's like two different men. I know it's him because his name, Korovkin Nikolai Alexandrovich, is written there. Even his facial features are different, which shows how his spirit had been broken. His expressions were different too. He was unrecognizable. Daniel is one of the last people to have seen Nikolai Korovkin alive inside the head of security's office where he witnessed the beatings he was given. Nikolai tried to move away and the screw told him, you going to make a fuss again? And he grabbed him by the arm and, and began to beat him. Nikolai fell onto his knees and bent over and that's when he was struck about the head. He lost consciousness and fell down. For having given evidence to an NGO, Nikolai was raped by his jailers. Officially, Nikolai died of AIDS. But the photos taken by the forensic scientist tell a different story. We also managed to get hold of a series of audio recordings made a month before his death. Hello, this is Colony 6. You want to speak to prisoner Korovkin? In this extract, Nikolai Korovkin is talking to his father. He's been the victim of extortion. At the very least, we need a cement mixer, you hear me? You understand? That way things will be easier for me in the camp and, and at work, so I can have visits and normal treatment. And where do we send it to? To Colony 6. Well, what do you think? Here, of course. A cement mixer is maybe not such a surprising request. The prison warden saw in Nikolai's files that his sister was employed in the public work sector. With our documents, we pay a visit to the parents of Nikolai Korovkin. At first, they'd refused to see us. But on the staircase, we come across some of their neighbors. We'll go together. If they say no, well, they say no. Let's go. 
Come on, let's go and look at, just look at this guy here. Come on, let's go together. I know all about this. I've seen it all before. They claim he died of AIDS. Like that, on his own. You, us, nobody can do anything. The corruption is at the very top. All the way up. It's all the way down. His parents finally allow us inside. Alexander and Lyubov have retreated into their own grief. They say they've paid a hundred thousand rubles in just two months to try and protect their son the equivalent of almost $3,500. I gave them my last copay. So that it would be better for him. It just became worse. They just get richer. Damn it. An investigation began into the death of Nikolai. One year after his death, his parents are still waiting for the truth. It went all the way up to Moscow, but nothing happened. So the prosecutors are not doing anything? Of course not. They're all in this together. What do you expect them to do? Whatever we do, the camp governors will go unpunished. And it will all continue like before. Except my son will never come back to me. That day, Daniil, the former detainee, and Oksana, the human rights activist, were picked up in broad daylight. They've been taken to this clinic for drug testing. The police suspect them of consuming and dealing in drugs. I don't know why they arrested us. They say they suspect I was carrying drugs. They asked to see my papers. And then they frisked us. Uh, what did they search? Uh, my pockets, uh, then the car, personal belongings, and the boot. Of course they found nothing. They want me to stop? Okay, I'll stop. While the whole mutiny incident isn't over, they want me to stop. And not press the matter further. They want to scare the people working with me. Since the mutiny, Oksana says she's felt threatened. She thinks she's been followed and her conversations recorded. Her fear is to be sent back to prison. After a few hours, the tests have proved negative, and Daniela and Oksana are allowed to leave. So you're free? Yes, it's the second time they've let me go. They've been out for only a month. And they've found a pretext to hold me for four and a half hours now. We're not free to move around. Our rights count for nothing. <laughs> it's like that every day. There's always something. The next day, we pay one final visit to the suburbs of Chelyabinsk, not far from Colony 6. Daniel has a hearing before the tribunal investigating the death of Nikolai Korovkin. I have no confidence in Russian justice. Of course. The saying goes that hope is the last to die. And deep down, I have that hope. But I understand full well that I might end up in prison again. Daniel arrives at the tribunal with his lawyer. Also present is the senior staff from Colony 6. Denis Mikhanov, the director and Konstantin Shegel, the head of security. Both men's names feature prominently in grievances filed by prisoners. 
Despite this, it's Daniil who finds himself in the dock. Will the accused stand to hear his rights? For having testified on the death of Nikolai Korovkin, Daniil is charged with libel. I can't even bear to look at them. They've behaved like criminals. But they're here now as the victims. Beats everything. It's tough being here, especially with Shigol. It's just too much. And Mekhanov, he threatened me in solitary, saying he'd make my death look like a suicide. At the end of the audience, we try and speak with the directors. I'm telling you, don't film me. They agree to talk off camera, but we secretly continue to film them. They accuse me of, quote, killing Korovkin. It's not true. We have proof. We have the files. No one ever beat Korovkin? No. No. Do I look like a torturer? That's enough. Come on, let's go. Charges against the two prison managers for the death of Korovkin are dropped. They don't seem too concerned. They know the system will protect them. Daniel risks a six-year term for libel. But he won a temporary reprieve when the court transferred his case to another jurisdiction. The present of sorts, as the young man celebrated his 30th birthday the same day.